everyone to this session. Um, this is a session on the role of soft law and the principles of responsible sovereign lending and borrowing, which as you know, is one of the work streams um, that we've been conducting under the project. So uh, within this project, um, we have really attempted to revitalize um, what has been seminal work done by ANCLAD um, on the, the principles of responsible sovereign lending and borrowing. Um, this was work that was published and launched and indeed ratified through by countries within their own national spaces um, from 2012 onwards. Um, but there has been a sort of a, 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 a sense in which there is space now for us to revitalize these principles. And in order to discuss how that sits within this broader debate on the role of soft law, um, we have uh, within the panel, um, Stephanie Blankenberg, who is the head of the UNCLAD Debt and Development Finance Branch. Um, Stephanie um, has been leading this branch for the last five or seven years. In time, seven. seven years. Yeah. And um, she is very much um, the right person to give us this introduction because this role of soft law is something that she has um, had as an ongoing theme within the work of the branch, uh, within larger panels, uh, within the debt management conference, and even within the IGE on finance for development. So Stephanie, it's a delight to have you here. Um, what would you say are the main aspects of the soft law and the principles of responsible sovereign and borrowing that you'd like to bring to the attention here of the audience? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much, Penelope. Um, I have to say that, uh, um, of course, the anchored um, uh, principles on responsible sovereign lending and borrowing were fully developed and were on uh, um, had uh, again very wide international recognition uh, recognition by the time I arrived uh, at anchored in 2015. They subsequently, as Penelope sort of hinted at. Um, um, while they always stayed at, at uh, the center of much of our work, um, 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 uh, how can I put this, uh, um, were, uh, became politically more, more contentious in a wider context. Um, and also uh, um, uh, what we saw uh, in the past, I would say three to five years was a kind of flood, uh, so to speak, of um, soft law projects, uh, soft law pieces of work, in particular also from the G20, that sort of um, um, were never placed in any kind of clear relationship to those principles. But before I come back to um, the ANTA principles themselves very briefly, because I know that, of course, primarily um, uh, Yufin uh, Lee, who see the, the main uh, architect to work together with her team of these principles, as well as other colleagues on this panel uh, will say uh, more in the detail about the principles themselves. I would just like to say a couple of things, partly as a reminder, I suppose, to all of us on uh, um, the role and the possibilities of soft law approaches in uh, uh, general. So, of course, the, the, the um, uh, core characteristic that distinguishes uh, soft from hard law approaches is that there is no formal enforcement. So we are looking here at rules or standards that are not legally uh, binding. So we are uh, moving in a world that is based on the principle of informality. That does not mean uh, that there are no mechanisms um, um, to uh, push implementation at various levels. And I come back to that of uh, soft law uh, um, projects or approaches, but they do rely essentially on um, incentives to comply, indirect incentives often to comply, uh, such as moral persuasion, um, fear of, of adverse action in the case of non-compliance, rather than uh, on uh, hard law enforcement um, mechanisms. And we are of course looking here in particular at the role of international uh, soft law in a context in um, which globalization uh, has um, challenged traditional lawmaking processes 
uh, within largely national boundaries. Um, and this, of course, also applies to the specific area which uh, concerns international financial relations and laws um, and the various uh, uh, sets of standards, rules, principles, guidelines, codes of conduct, bad practices in this area. So that there may there are few exceptions in this area at the international level anyway, such as the IMF Articles of Agreement, but this really is the exception rather than the rule generally speaking. Now, uh, just to recap, uh, recap briefly, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of international soft law approaches, in particular also uh, from the point of view, but not only, of developing countries. Now, on the, on the upside, on the side of advantages, of course, um, uh, there is a lot more flexibility, there's pragmatism, there's informality, um, and one isn't necessarily bogged down by what, what is a formal, very time consuming, very slow process of international, uh, of the creation and the agreement of international um, treaties. Now, um, of course, um, that also means it has implications for, for, for the perceived legitimacy of soft law approaches uh, that often are very closely related to um, uh, the modus operandi through which um, a certain international soft law projects have come about, both including the level of expertise, the recognition, the international recognition of the experts that have uh, uh, contributed to us and the and mechanism of both uh, a mutual trust in this regard, rather than a formal institutional um, legitimacy. And there are of course of many channels in which the um, recognition and implementation of soft law principles um, can be um, advanced. M most common is the use of such principles at the national level, where of course uh, it must never be forgotten that soft law is moved in the first step towards hard law. That's certainly true at the, at the national level, but at the international level, uh, we also have something such as international hard law such as, for example, if you think of standards on money laundering and uh, countering the financing of terrorism, for example, hard in the sense that there are sanctions if countries do not ab abide um, by, by these soft laws, even though they're not legally binding, if they're not respected, uh, there, are, there can be sanctions, such as countries being put on blacklists, um, for example, sanctions that affect um, the, um, uh, the performance of countries. In the case of uh, the particular principles that we are looking at that are um, 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 that apply accepted and established international legal norms to the area of sovereign debt crisis prevention and resolution, there's an additional uh, mechanism uh, that could uh, uh, push a serious implementation, namely that is to incorporate such kind of uh, public international soft law in, um, into private sovereign debt instruments, for example, as uh, um, by giving a contract chase of law, cl uh, law clauses, for example, uh, meaning that certain uh, uh, principles and the application of those is negotiated in advance of any uh, crisis. Uh, uh, broadly speaking, of course, there have to be some sort of monetary mechanisms for the uh, still voluntary implementation um, of uh, uh, such principles, if, there, if uh, the idea is that one uh, would move from the design of those principles to gradual legal reform at national and possibly international um, levels. That's of course of particular relevance for developing countries in areas that are of such strong concern uh, to them as we have seen uh, this morning, namely um, the, the management of, uh, in particular, public external debt, um, insofar as, as uh, uh, um, a thoroughly done, respected, uh, and in this informal sense, legitimate um, set of uh, public international principles uh, can help to, to, to guide uh, national reform in terms of uh, both uh, constitutional provisions, but also in terms of efforts to build regulatory institutional uh, uh, frameworks at home to facilitate the implementation of such principles, but also, of course, in terms of um, an international uh, set of principles that they can appeal to uh, and that they can agree to appeal to in restructuring negotiations, for example. 
Now, these are broadly speaking the, the advantages, or more broadly speaking, the, the, the potential um, of uh, a, a softer approaches if uh, um, correctly done um, in this area. Drawbacks, of course, are also um, are also sort of, uh, if you like, the flip side of the of, of, of this coin, in that um, there can, of course, be questions raised about legitimacy, accountability. Uh, often, uh, soft law principles do not necessarily have a whole apparatus of, uh, say, arbitration um, and even informal enforcement processes attached with them. Um, there have, of course, uh, sometimes also be voiced uh, concerns by uh, uh, at the national level by governments about um, erosion of national sovereignty by uh, through the recognition of such principles and concerns about country ownership. Um, there can be issues of um, norms uh, uh, entailed in such principles um, uh, being incompatible with domestic legal culture, at least, if not uh, um, particular structures. And um, 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 there can be issues in uh, how to use soft law principles without um, creating legal uncertainty. And so it's, it can be difficult sometimes to use soft law approaches um, without avoiding problems of legal certainty and predictability. That would not necessarily arise or to a lesser extent uh, from hard work. So these are, um, uh, these are problems and the problems that are certainly faced in this area as well is that there can be, if, the, if you suddenly have a prolif proliferation of su such standards, then that can lead to inconsistency, to overlaps, to gaps, uh, to further uh, uh, legal uncertainty or, or bro more broadly sp uh, speaking conceptual uncertainty uh, as well. Now, what must not be forgotten and is very important in this area is that there is not just such a thing as um, international, in this case, soft law versus hard law, but there's of course a hierarchy of international soft law. So not all um, soft law is the same. So uh, what we're looking at uh, is a range from, uh, uh, from simply looking at professional practices, that's at the lowest end of the legal scale, so to speak, that's best practices. Uh, then to uh, rules, codes, guidelines, and uh, a full set of principles that is rooted in already accepted international uh, legal norms. So, um, for example, an example other than the other than the um, ANTA principles on responsible sovereign lending and borrowing is um, um, ANCITRAL's work. That's the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law to offer a set of rules that has been produced and agreed by scholars that represent um, the main legal discourse uh, at a global level. So that um, is, is, if you like, the highest end of this, um, uh, of this hierarchy in terms of uh, implied legal, um, uh, legal <clears throat> uh, relevance or effect. Then, of course, you can have principles applying um, uh, to different, uh, to, to wider areas that they can have uh, global uh, reach, they can have um, uh, regional reach, they can have, uh, they can apply it to particular sectors, they can um, focus on particular functional standards um, that would differentiate them. Um, uh, and, and they can also be substantive, uh, a set of substantive uh, 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 soft law principles as opposed to, uh, for example, principles that would allocate uh, regulatory jurisdiction that would be uh, primarily procedural. Now, what is important to understand about the UNCTAD uh, uh, principles, I think, and then um, uh, I'm sure Yufin and others will, uh, will say uh, more about this, is that they, in the area of uh, um, uh, international soft law on uh, debt crisis prevention and resolution, uh, they are at the top of this hierarchy of soft law. That means um, the principles postulating essential responsibilities and duties both on the lender and the borrower side um, were developed on the basis of a very uh, a high quality in-depth legal and economic research and a thorough and inclusive consultative process 
that sought uh, to balance the diverse range, not just of views of stakeholders, but also uh, different um, types of legal interpretations, for example, of the international uh, uh, legal norms um, that underlie those principles. In total, and Dufin will correct me if I'm getting uh, the slightly wrong, but to my um, knowledge, there were uh, close to 70 countries, member states, involved in these consultations. Um, major international organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the OECD, as well as leading civil society um, organizations, non-governmental organizations, uh, were consulted uh, in the drafting process. And that means that uh, uh, the way I put it is that these principles in this area at the top of the hierarchy um, of um, <clears throat> different types of, uh, of soft law approaches. And that has been very widely recognized, um, certainly, for example, in the um, Addis Abeba action agenda, where there are mentioned, repeat mentioned in a, a range of UN documents, um, such as uh, the General Assembly uh, resolution, but also other documents. Um, um, <clears throat> and of course, very importantly, uh, through the incorporation of five of the core principles informing um, the responsibilities and duties, both on the lender and on the borrower side, that, that were formulated in these principles in the UN, not UNCTAD, UN principles on basic sovereign uh, debt restructuring processes that were adopted by the General Assembly uh, in September 2015. Those four um, principles are good faith, transparency, impartiality, legitimacy, and sustainability. The UN principles then contain a, a couple of, well, it, it's exactly four additional principles, but those core principles were taken directly from the UNCTAD uh, principles in the um, negotiations around this uh, particular UN um, resolution. And those five are, of course, also the core international, very well-established international legal norms that in this case are simply applied to the area of sovereign debt crisis um, um, prevention and uh, resolution emphasis in this case on prevention. Furthermore, um, there are the principles themselves, but of course, UNCTAD also by 2014 um, had developed guidelines um, for uh, uh, the use and implementation of these principles that are, if you like, at the level, at the legally speaking, lower level of best practice. But this this work was done and it's very important um, for countries at the national level to be able uh, to work with the principles. And um, um, furthermore, even before this current project, um, again, around 2015, largely to do uh, with subsequent resource constraints as well on our end, um, there was a technical cooperation project that for five uh, low income countries looked at uh, regulatory institutional gaps in these countries that uh, might make the implementation of the principles uh, more difficult and how to uh, address those. Now, the same can definitely not be said. Thanks, for Stephanie, I wonder if you could just bring it to an end. Yep, we'll do, right yeah. now, well done. And just surely say the same can definitely not be said for a, for a whole flood of principles uh, that some existed before the UNCTAD principles, but most importantly, more recently, the G20 operational guidelines on sustainable financing and IFF uh, principles on um, debt transparency. So this is a, a, the sort of frame to set this, uh, uh, the discussion now um, on the panel more specifically on uh, the principles on responsible sovereign uh, lending and borrowing. And in particular, of course, also the ways in which this project has already helped to revitalize them and hopefully further proposals on how to further uh, revitalize and um, uh, promote the, princ uh, the principles in developing countries, but in, in of course, also, and very importantly, in uh, creditor uh, centers and creditor countries. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Thanks for that overview. Um, I think that having set the stage in the way you've done now with soft law, uh, and particularly talking about how um, the importance of soft law, it's not unimportant simply because it's, um, not legislated, and that, of course, the hierarchy is very important to recognize. Um, I would now like to invite the rest of the panelists. We have, we begin with Yufen Lee, who um, is currently a senior advisor at the South Cent South South Cooperation and Development Finance um, Division at South Center. 
She was previously um, the UN expert on foreign debt and human rights. Um, and she also was um, in UNTAD indeed as the head of the debt and development finance branch. Um, and she was in fact the, the one who led this work on the principles. So in many ways we see her as the, um, the godmother. I hope you don't uh, find that a bad appellation of the principles. Um, so Yufin, you're going to start the discussion. Um, if I may, I would just like to also then just briefly introduce the rest of the panelists. Jeff Debro um, is currently um, a, a, an economist and a um, consultant. He works with Nexus um, uh, and in fact works physically um, and virtually in the Nexus between Parliament and public financial management. Um, he has also been affiliated with some of the partners in this project, including the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Um, and he is going to really focus on some of the work that he's been done, been doing on re revitalizing the principles in two Asian Pacific countries. And thereafter, we're going to have two interventions, one from Mr. Jacob Mkandawere, who is economist at the Bank of Zamba, Zambia. He's also the former director of the Investment and Debt Management Department at the Zambian Ministry of Finance. And then we will also be joined, um, and I welcome Mr. Um, uh, Wong Chen, who is a member of Parliament of Malaysia. Um, he's currently a member of the Special Select Committee on Finance and Economy, and will share with us his experience on how parliaments can contribute um, in applying and implementing principles. So. Over to you, Yufin, um, if you can just set the stage for us on the principles. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Penelope. Uh, thank you for the kind words of introduction. And uh, also uh, thank you for the invitation to this meeting. Uh, I think Stephanie has set the scene very well relating to uh, the importance of uh, soft law. Uh, is advantages, uh, disadvantages, uh, as well as uh, the hierarchy, which uh, Penelope said is not very easy to identify sometimes. Uh, indeed, soft law can be very important, uh, especially so for sovereign financing, uh, as it is uh, one of the most underdeveloped areas of international law. Uh, we know very well that sovereign debts are mainly governed by domestic laws, mostly UK law, US law, and some domestic laws of the borrowing countries. Uh, as a result, there are no clear boundaries or expectations relating to creditor and borrower behavior. So this legal void has contributed to insufficient deterrence to irresponsible or suboptimal uh, sovereign lending and borrowing uh, as a, attempts to introduce hard international law and regulations uh, which are binding on countries have suffered repeated setbacks uh, and uh, international consensus uh, has been difficult to reach as mentioned by Stephanie just now, just imagine an international a treaty would take years and years uh, to develop and uh, uh, mobilize consensus. Because of this, uh, past decades have witnessed uh, efforts to develop uh, soft laws or norms uh, for the purpose of introducing uh, behavioral changes and set clear boundaries for appropriate uh, conduct. Uh, UNTAD principles uh, was uh, officially launched, as mentioned just now, in 2012, uh, have been uh, acknowledged for the comprehensive coverage of debt instruments, inclusiveness in the formulation, validation, and consensus building process, and uh, also uh, mentioned just now, the uh, solid backstopping uh, by scholarly research and uh, uh, analysis. Uh, I would skip some of the things I wanted to say just now because uh, uh, Stephanie has uh, already covered, 
uh, very well the importance of soft law, so I will not go further. Uh, UNCTAD started to work on the principles uh, in 2008, when the global financial crisis was still evolving and deregulation and financial liberalization in the past decades uh, have left developing countries more vulnerable uh, than before. Uh, the crisis generated uh, widespread concern uh, about uh, the lack of international rules and uh, weak regulation of the financial sector. Uh, as the uh, global financial system was and still is dominated by the uh, post-World War II power structure, uh, maintaining the status quo uh, has been attractive to uh, major part market players. Uh, but for UNCTAD, we had the ambition, uh, ambition to develop uh, a set of soft law. Uh, we, the financial support of Norway, uh, UNCTAD started to work in earnest. Um, on the whole, we could say that UNCTAD is very well positioned to work on the principles uh, because of its uh, uh, position in the UN system as uh, the um, focal point on the debt issues and uh, uh, UNCTAD secretaries has the mandates and uh, also acknowledge expertise on debt issues. Uh, moreover, at that point, uh, people uh, widely acknowledge that one advantage is that UNCTAD is not a financial actor in the global market. So UNCTAD was and still is in a unique institutional position to promote a set of principles to introduce uh, uh, financial behavioral changes. Um, the, uh, to be inclusive and authoritative, uh, UNCTAD established an expert group uh, in order to have open, transparent, and inclusive dialogue among all stakeholders. Uh, the expert group was composed of very prominent, world-renowned uh, specialists in law, finance, and economics. Uh, the expert group was really like a who's who in the sovereign debt world, many famous names there. Uh, Stephanie mentioned just now that NGOs was represented, the private sector was represented, and the head of IAF actually, you know, was there in most of the meetings. Uh, for multilateral uh, in financial institutions, the IMF World Bank were represented at quite high level, but they uh, opted to be observers. I, I think they, 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 they are mandated not to uh, participate uh, directly. Uh, the same with the Paris Club, the chairman was there uh, for many of the sessions, not completely uh, all the sessions. Uh, there was also an advisory committee which was composed of the interested UN member states. Uh, the committee was informed regularly of the progress of the project and they also had the opportunity to air their views. Uh, after more than a year's year of in-depth study and exchange of views, uh, UNCTAD had the first draft of the principles. Uh, each principle had an analytical piece by famous scholars and eventually uh, in 2015 or in 2015, I think, uh, there was uh, a book published by the University Press uh, to, it's a collection of uh, the uh, studies uh, done for the various principles. Uh, when UNCTAD had the second draft, extensive dialogue were uh, conducted and uh, validation was undertaken in earnest at the ministerial level. During 2011 and 12, five regional consultative meetings uh, with national officials at ministerial level took place in Buenos Aires, Bangkok, Geneva, Giada, and uh, Punta Gana. Uh, in order to get governmental uh, feedback on the design and also the possible implementation uh, of the principles. Uh, Stephanie, you are right. Uh, around 75 countries provided uh, their views uh, on the draft principles. 
Uh, and after a series of bilateral and high level regional uh, uh, governmental consultations, uh, the expert group introduced the further revisions uh, to the draft principles uh, in line with the feedback uh, obtained. Uh, the consolidated version of the principles was launched on the occasion of UNCTAD 13 uh, ministerial conference in Doha in 2012. That, and that started the uh, official process of endorsement and implementation of the principles. Uh, the uh, UNCTAD principles was endorsed by uh, 13 developed and uh, developing countries. And as mentioned just now, uh, it was uh, repeatedly endorsed, supported, mentioned at uh, various international conferences, uh, in particular, the uh, UN General Assembly uh, resol debt resolutions, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the FFD uh, Addis Ababa uh, agenda, action agenda. Uh, so uh, th this uh, kind of endorsement uh, was uh, not enjoyed by, by some other uh, self-law principles, uh, I think. Uh, one important thing, uh, for uh, UNCTAD uh, principles was the emphasis of uh, co-responsibilities of both uh, lenders and borrowers. Uh, and this actually corrected the misconception uh, that borrowers are the only party to be blamed in the case of unsustainable debt. Uh, and we know that uh, the principles uh, have uh, two uh, sections for lenders, and another, the other section for uh, borrowers. Uh, the normative contribution of these principles uh, lie, lies not in the creation of new rights uh, or no obligations, but in identifying, harmonizing, and systemizing uh, the basic principles and best practices applied to sovereign lending and borrowing. Uh, and also in elaborating the implications of these standards and practices for lenders and borrowers at the international level. Uh, so, thank you. I wonder if I can just ask you to wrap up now. So okay. Uh, All right. And for implementation, there are various ways for implementation uh, to, to adopt national laws. Of course, just now uh, we mentioned that UNCTAD had the guiding principles uh, and it could also be used for in, interpreting, interpreting the uh, legal judgments and uh, it could also guide uh, some of that management and capacity building. Uh, so what I want to say is that uh, UNCTAD principles uh, were developed in such a way it's, uh, which itself carries the kind of uh, uh, legitimacy and uh, uh, ways in the international arena. And one thing to mention is uh, about the uh, GA uh, uh, debt resolution on debt restructuring, actually that uh, uh, the principles on debt restructuring was based on the uh, UNCTAD project, which was the extension of the development of the principles and the uh, UNCTAD secretariat actually submitted the analytical findings uh, to uh, the uh, GA uh, in order for the formulation of the principles on debt restructuring. So on the whole, we would say that revitalizing and implementing the UNCTAD principles would benefit the world and contribute to debt crisis prevention and resolution. And ultimately, this will also benefit global financial stability. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yufin. Um, I think that really is very helpful for you to take us through that history of how we ended up where we are. Um, and with that in mind, I'm now going to hand over to Jeff Dubrow, who's going to really try and take us through some of the work he's been doing in in-depth work around um, revitalizing. What will it take to revitalize the principles in national countries? Thank you, Jeff. Over to you. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Penelope. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be working uh, with you on this and, and you fan for on this exciting project. Um, I, I just want to say for me personally, the way that the, the principles has shaped and, and frankly, Penelope, you person you you directly have shaped my thinking around um, around public debt and uh, around the work that I'm doing in oversight of public debt, particularly with parliaments, goes back to what Yufen just said, which was before I had the, the pleasure of, of speaking with you, uh, I think I was much more focused on the, the obligations of the sovereign borrower as, as an agent, you know, as, as per the, how the principles are stated. Um, and I think your your contribution and the principal's contribution was to give me a much more well-rounded understanding of the, the obligations of the lenders. And so just to illustrate from a parliamentary perspective, that, that also means uh, not only providing capacity development to parliaments on issues related to the role of parliament and oversight of public debt and really understanding the responsibilities of the borrowers, but also to help parliamentarians understand and advocate for more responsible lending practices within their own country. So it's been quite influential. And as a result, the opportunity to deep dive into this project has been absolutely, uh, absolutely fascinating for me. Um, I hate to be the only one to share a PowerPoint presentation, but I think it would just be helpful because of the amount that I want to say and the, the, the amount, little bit limited time that I have to say it. Um, I won't read the, 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 the slide, but this just gives you an idea, which is really about the terms of reference of the project, which is very much related to the revitalization, as you've already said, um, of the principles. Um, and um, as per the, the terms of reference, the focus is on select uh, Asia Pacific uh, developing countries. In, in selecting those countries uh, for this, this study, uh, in, in close consultation with the, the steering committee, which of course is yourself, uh, Yufen and uh, Franklin DeVries from the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, uh, a number of countries were, were considered. Uh, so we tried to make it as pseudo-scientific as possible. Um, and a number of factors were taken into consideration, including the relative risk of death distress, because it's my unfortunately strong belief that countries tend to be more focused on this issue when, when they're at high risk of debt distress or in debt distress, as unfortunate as that is. Uh, cooperation from partner organizations, uh, particularly WFD. Uh, I'm not sure why I left UADP on there. I don't think that really figured too prominently in, 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 in this particular um, effort, but certainly the Westminster Foundation, as well as DEMFAS. Uh, my own personal experience working with uh, the, the parliament, uh, parliaments in, in, in the area certainly was a factor in terms of being able to reach out to individuals and the level of engagement of key players on the grounds, uh, you know, whether we had strong champions and points of contact that we could, uh, we could work with. The two countries ultimately selected were the Maldives and the Philippines. Um, one of the uh, interesting, um, I don't want to say requirements, but certainly criteria that, that UNCTAD had was for the study was to try to look at countries with different political systems. And so um, we looked at the Maldives, which has a parliamentary system and the Philippines, which has uh, at, at the national level, a presidential system. Um, the Maldives was also selected because of its strong leadership uh, in parliament uh, in addressing public debt, specifically with regard to the committee on debt restructuring. And I don't want to overemphasize the parliamentary angle just because I'm a parliamentary specialist, but I think that was a recognition that this was a very prominent issue in the country. And that if parliament was busy on this issue, uh, it was very likely that we would also see involvement on the part of, uh, uh, you know, that, the, that, that this would be something that the, the debt management unit would be very focused on as well. Uh, as well, we were able to engage um, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy that has programming in, in, in the Maldives. Um, and they've been very helpful in, in providing us with contacts, not only in parliament, but also in civil society uh, and in, um, uh, in, in the debt management unit. The Philippines, uh, of course, uh, had strong involvement in the development of the UNCTAD principles. So it was interesting to be able to go back and, and sort of trace back and see whether or not, uh, or to the extent to which they've actually been uh, implementing those principles. Um, and the fact that UNCTAD was a DEMFAS partner program, a pro program partner made it, made, gave us a, 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 an opportunity to, uh, to reach out to them through that, through that program. 
Um, I'll just say very quickly that um, uh, the, the, we did develop a survey, uh, online survey, uh, and uh, those have been circulated to the ministries of finance, the parliaments, and civil society organizations. The research tends to focus more on the borrowing side than the lending side. However, borrowers were asked if they knew of constraints on or requirements for lenders. And I'll come back to that issue in a little while because I think it is, uh, it is quite important. The, the types of survey questions that were posed uh, with guidance from the steering committee really were, were th falling into three, um, three broad types. So first of all, um, the questions were used to distinguish between soft laws, which were described as practices and hard laws, which were, code of, which were described as codified legislation, um, falling into basically three categories. And I'll just, I'll just give you some examples. These are all from the lending side, but nonetheless, we'll give you an example. The first one was looking at the type of legislation or practices that exist that support a given principle. Um, so that doesn't necessarily suggest that that this particular practice is based is is influenced by the principles, but it does demonstrate that there are there is a synergy between the principles and particular practices. The second type pertain to. Uh, whether legislation was enshrined in, in, in law or whether there was a practice. Um, so for example, um, asking whether the borrower has any anti-bribery legislation or code of ethics that would prevent or discourage a breach of duty related to the issuance of loans, um, we would be asking not only whether that, that exists, but also uh, whether or not it's actually enforced. And asking then on for the influence of the principles uh, in that particular area. Uh, third was asking the degree to which a practice or legislation's implementation was influenced by the principles. Um, and here we're just again engaging the sort of the yes/no question, but we're also looking at um, whether the principles were influential uh, in uh, in the in the um, uh, development of these uh, either practices or legislation. I'll, I'll share some specific conclusions with you in, in more detail, particularly for the Maldives. I just want to say that unfortunately we're still chasing the Philippines and that, and as we were, Yufan and I were remarking uh, at the uh, sort of off camera at the beginning, um, this is sort of a, a standard practice for anybody who's involved in surveys. I've got a couple other surveys on the go right now. And it, 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 so it really is a matter of chasing. So I don't have any um, uh, direct conclusions to, to, to share with you right now about the Philippines, but I certainly will be talking about the Maldives. Um, I think it, it, it is difficult to identify the lending practices from sovereign borrowers. In other words, what we tried to do, I think just because of the scope of the project um, and, and the fact that it's being held remotely, we weren't necessarily engaging financial institutions in these countries. And so I think what we tried to do was to try to see if we could, we could get information from the borrowers about their understanding of lending practices. And, and not surprisingly, that's, you know, for people who have ex deep dive expertise in the debt management unit, they're certainly going to know their, uh, their operations, but they may not have access to the information about individual lending practices. And so, um, unfortunately, it's been, it's been difficult to identify those lending practices. That suggests to me that a separate study may be very helpful at some point, um, which would be, I think, very structured very differently. That would be looking specifically at the lending side. Not to say we can't, we won't get any information on the lending side, but I think the deep dive would be very helpful uh, in, future, in, in, in future considerations. Um, certainly in the Maldives, with the limited feedback we've received so far, it seems like they, and I'm going to give it, go into detail on these principles and give you some specific examples. So, um, don't feel that I'm just going to sort of uh, pawn it off and say numerous principles, but but certainly it seems that when it comes to the borrowing side, there the, the principles have been influential, um, very influential and somewhat influential, which is part of our five point scale that I showed you. I think it's the third. So I'll come to that in a moment. I think the third comment is that it's easier to identify instances in which soft law has morphed into hard law. 
I think it's a little more difficult to identify particular practices um, that are not part of hard law uh, or not go governed by hard law. Um, and frankly, practices change over time for a variety of reasons. So, you know, interesting if I just flip slides for a second and share with you um, the debt transparency heat map from the World Bank. Uh, I see that despite the fact that the Maldives is pushing very hard in a number of areas to strengthen their debt management practices, which should, um, which I think also reflects a commitment to implementation of the principles, you'll see that there has been some uh, backsliding in their debt transparency reporting from between 2021 and 2020 with, for example, the annual borrowing plan rating going down from a, a sorry, the, um, I think I have the years mixed up on that. Um, my apologies, let me double check that and I'll get back to you. But I, but, but just to give that example that sometimes practices unfortunately do, um, are, are often very much, um, do tend to change. And that's why it's sometimes hard to measure uh, whether a, a particular practice has been, been implemented or is continuing to be implemented. I think a, one conclusion that I can share with you, given my experience working um, for over 20 years in, in capacity development and training, is I think there is more of a need for a programmatic approach to support the dissemination and implementation of the principles. Um, you know, and this could mean uh, training to create awareness about and maintain awareness about the principles. Um, it could mean capacity development to strengthen the actual implementation of the principles. Um, and it could also mean um, integrating the principles into other institutional programs related to public debt management, uh, which would include work that the IMF and the World Bank are doing. Certainly the Westminster Foundation for Democracy has, has taken the principles on board. But I think, I think it's tough to go back um, after a, a long period of time and try to trace the uh, causality. Um, I think those frequent interventions uh, are, very, are gonna be very, help, would be very helpful. And I recognize that there are different types of institutions in the UN system. Um, you know, for example, UNDP obviously is, is, tends to focus almost exclusively on training and capacity development. Um, so it, it, the different organizations such as Onted may have different approaches, but it's certainly something to consider going forward. I think I'll skip this, but I, I um, unless uh, there's a, a significant nod uh, from, from Penelope to proceed, but I just wanted to say that I, I, I host a podcast and I had an interview uh, very recently with Tim Jones from Debt Justice. And he, he mentioned specifically uh, the, the issue about certainly that, that, that the NGO or CSO community is very strong in strong support of the lender uh, side of the principles, but, that the, but the problem is that they're not being abided to by. Um, and I think it's quite important to, uh, to, to mention that. Um, so in, in, in absence of strong conclusions around, at this point at least, preliminary conclusions around uh, lender um, uh, incorporation of the principles into their practices. I, I think in this clip that I, um, that I put up on the screen, he, he essentially expresses concern about the lack of implementation uh, across the board. And that may be, may be helpful to put some perspective, but I don't necessarily have to share that with you now, but at least it's there in case you, you wanna see it. Becoming a little bit more specific, um, I think it was, uh, there were a number of principles in the surveys that we received back where um, in the Maldives specifically, uh, for principle nine for binding agreements, for example, um, the principles were deemed to be very influential in the development of provisions in legislation that required debts to be honored on time and in full. Um, as well as very influential when it came to debt payments being suspended in the event of a, a natural disaster or other external shock. When it comes to transparency, um, legislative involvement in decisions about whether and how to incur debt, again, the principles were deemed to be uh, very influential in that regard, as well as uh, having legislation that specified the responsibilities and accountabilities for 
public debt management, uh, as well as the conformity of debt reporting to international standards and norms for compiling debt statistics. On principle 11, with regard to disclosure and publication, we still have some work to do in this regard. However, it was noted that there are uh, a, a, a significant number of reports that are being produced by the, uh, by the government in the, Maldives, in the Maldives, uh, namely the annual report on public debt, the medium term debt strategy and the debt statistical bulletin. And obviously, um, as we know, this is not a given in many countries. So the fact that these um, documents are being produced by the government gives us the opportunity to then, during our interviews um, with, as a follow-up to the survey, to get a better sense of how the formulation of these documents um, were influenced by the principles. So it's, it, but it's good to note that the practice is there. Uh, and then we can find out more about how the prin principles were influential. With respect to project financing, um, the principles were deemed as somewhat influential as opposed to very influential uh, with respect to projects being registered as contingent liabilities and also legislation or regulations on loan conditions um, requiring loans to be used only for the purposes intended in the loan agreement. Um, principle 13 with regard to adequate management and monitoring. Um, I, 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 as you'll see, this looks good on paper, but the reality is that um, there, there doesn't appear to be, and, and in, mo in many cases, as, as we know, when it comes to audit, there's always a lot of work to be done to strengthen the role of Supreme Audit institutions in uh, oversight of public debt. Um, they are currently conducting audits of debt management operations, but these are financial audits only. They're not compliance audits or performance audits. Um, and so um, the, the principles were deemed somewhat influential in the, in the audits of debt management operations when it came to, to finance the financial audit only. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do. Um, the systems in place to monitor subnational debt and contingent liabilities, again, the principles were, were deemed to be somewhat influential. And last but not least, and this goes back to what Stephanie was saying, uh, that the with regard to restructuring, and specifically the Maldives uh, has done a lot of work on restructuring their debt in the last few years, and including the parliamentary committee that I mentioned. Um, the basic principles adopted in debt restructuring have included um, data and policy transparency, open communication, and dialogue with creditors and investors, good faith negotiations, and fair treatment of creditors. So when we have our, our interviews with the debt management unit, we will definitely be following up to get a better sense of the, the, align, the deliberate alignment between the, the principles and, uh, and, and these, um, these debt structuring techniques. That gives you an overview of uh, sort of where the project is at to date. I, I truly hope that's been helpful. And uh, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jeff. I think um, you raise a number of issues, um, which I think are very valuable for us to consider um, at this time. And that is that, of course, um, this idea of implementation of soft law um, is in fact where the crux of the issue is. Um, we, we, we can have very beautiful and well-crafted soft law, but unless it actually becomes part of the implementation and can be seen to be so, um, it is exceptionally difficult. I mean, we as UNCTAD have also been involved um, in providing input and advice to um, the other side of the coin, the creditor side. Uh, for example, um, Norway, Norwegian's um, financial actors have really worked very hard over the last 18 months or so looking at responsible private um, investment um, in sovereign debt instruments with a view to saying, uh, taking the lead you know, if we are going to be involved in sovereign lending, what must we be doing? And the principles were a key foundation uh, to developing that approach. And I think that obviously these things need to be married ultimately. So thank you very much for that. We are looking forward to the final uh, report. And um, I would remind those who are in the session that um, this, this particular project, this 
development account project has only been two years, which is a um, half the time typically these technical assistance projects um, are, are given. And so there has been um, a huge uh, um, set sense of activity in trying to finish everything in time uh, for the end of the project. And thank you, Jeff, for uh, working um, at this last stretch. Um, now I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Mr. Jacob Mkandawe. Um, Jacob, I know that because we've had earlier interventions that in fact, um, you were very much involved in the investment and, and debt management department in the Zambian Ministry of Finance um, in the first round of the, the principles. And we would like very much to hear from you how you think uh, the principles can be revitalized. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Penelope, uh, uh, for, 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 for the introduction and uh, greetings to everyone on the call. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to join this conversation, very important and timely. I think uh, the unfortunate part about uh, initiatives on debt is that they gain momentum when there's a crisis, but nevertheless, we need to uh, get the job done. So um, our principles uh, also take this, uh, uh, I take the view on the principles as well. I think when we started with the principles 2009, uh, really it was uh, on the back of the HIPIC process and uh, the multilateral debt relief initiatives. And there was a lot of momentum and a lot of effort which culminated in the principles. I think the process was excellent. A lot of comprehensive engagement with a, a cross section of stakeholders. Um, so we are again at a point when we are seeing quite um, um, uh, crisis among um, developing countries in terms of the debt situation. And so it brings us back to the drawing board to again relook. So it's really um, uh, timely that we revitalize. Um, I won't go into the, the, the history. I think it's been very well covered by Stephanie um, uh, and uh, your friend in terms of our, our journey to, to, to this point. But just briefly to speak from a debt practitioner point of view, perhaps from a developing country, I think we, like has been mentioned already, um, in the HIPIC, uh, run up to HIPIC and so on, we were largely uh, considered as borrowers as the source of the problems. And so when the principles came on board, it was a, a, a fresh of breath air that we had a document that looked at both sides of the challenge. And so uh, sitting in a data office, that provided a key reference in terms of not only the capacity building that we received quite a lot of support on from the IMF, World Bank, ANCTAD, and so on in areas of uh, database developments and uh, analytical skills and so on. But now in the office, we had a reference in terms of process-wise, what should you look out for um, to, to establish you are doing something that perhaps is, um, is best practice, which was quite missing in the whole scheme um, of things. And also what to look out for on the lender side, for you to have a view that you are dealing with a lender who perhaps is also concerned about your situation. So there was a bridging of the information and knowledge gap around what's happening on both sides. So sitting in a debt office, it helped quite a great deal in drafting now operational manuals and things like that. Um, generally, that's the picture I, I, I've, I've, I've noted in most of our, our debt offices, except as uh, Jeff was saying, uh, many of us um, um, uh, use these principles not explicitly. So when you are really trying to search and uh, have the causality, you won't really see it, but it permits in terms of some of the guidelines that you find in these offices, some of the uh, laws that have come through really speak to some of the reference to these uh, uh, um, uh, principles that became the guiding note uh, in terms of uh, personalizing debt management. So we find that um, when you look at, for example, the DEMPA, the debt uh, management performance assessments that have been done, they have been showing some progressive um, uh, improvements in terms of general uh, debt management. It's still a lot of work to do, but it's because some of the adherence to the principles have come to pass 
and countries are increasingly adopting these uh, best practices and those assessments are helping to show that there is um, uh, improvement. And we see that um, in the current crisis, for example, most of the debt challenges are not largely associated with maybe carelessness on the part of the borrowers, but maybe because of external factors like shocks, COVID and so on, um, uh, commodity price shocks and so on that have led to the debt crisis. So more generally, in my view, the, the, the principles have done quite a great deal to bring awareness um, uh, to what uh, is supposed to be appropriate uh, considered in borrowing and also what to look out for on the lending side. So I, I would support the fact that uh, the principles have helped um, to bring uh, uh, these um, best practices into position. But quickly to just now focus maybe on the question raised, how do we revitalize? For me, I think Jeff has tried to really uh, give us a synopsis of where we are in terms of looking at um, uh, the, the principles and how perhaps they have uh, uh, come to pass. So I would speak more general to the projects you are doing and some of the things that in my view could help. I think uh, by and large for me, the major principle should be that we should uh, sell value in these principles for the countries, uh, the borrowers to adopt and also for the lenders. Uh, we can draw some lessons from, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the capital markets or domestic markets in terms of government securities and so on. There are soft rules there, but they are very well respected, very well adhered to because there's a sense of value for both the issuer and also the investor. And there's always uh, the follow-up, the prospectus, and so on. I think issues that Jeff also talked to about the frequency of dissemination. There has to be a deliberate roadmap in terms of uh, um, uh, disseminating the principles once we revitalize them. Uh, there are certain key steps that should come through to show Anctad that Yes, the principles have been endorsed and they will be utilized. I think the previous process just uh, went as far as indicating countries had endorsed them, but that did not have a lot of meaning in terms of practically how that gets um, onboarded into, uh, into the debt office uh, uh, management operations, so to say. And the endorsement, at what level uh, does that endorsement happen? Is it at the policy level? or are you talking to a debt manager level kind of endorsement? So there's needs to, as Jeff indicated, to have a, a programmatic program approach where we, we, we zero in exactly into what are the specifics that needs to be delivered. Obviously we can have the well-intentioned, well-articulated uh, principles, uh, but without the practical kind of steps in terms of realizing what these principles mean, at the application level, then we don't see much and we are not able to really review. And I understand Jeff's uh, uh, not seeing some of these relationships in terms of how they are helping in the debt office because we did not have these milestones that now we should be looking at to see whether we have uh, achieved what the principles we are setting out for. So in fact, I'm interested to see how the review will be done and what it is looking at. Uh, if uh, there were no clear um, pointers in terms of adopting or utilizing these principles. Uh, we, we, we obviously need to show value for adopting a principle and not adopting it. I think Stefan did do a good job in terms of explaining some of the adverse effects, perhaps if they are not uh, uh, onboarded in a debt office, but we need to be a bit more clear on that and spell it out very clearly in the dissemination as we roll out the, the revitalized principles. I think that should come out in my view very strongly. Um, the, the other aspects in my view is to strengthen dialogue. I think in the, in the process of coming up with them, um, uh, again, Stefan mentioned the diverse uh, academia and experts that came on board, but that conversation, once we have the broad picture of the principles, needs to go down to the people who are in the debt office. I think there's need to have now a practical trial run, if I can call it that, to really see, is this applicable? Is this understandable? 
is the language something that can easily be adopted or adapted um, in terms of uh, uh, the countries uh, picking up the principles? Um, is it in a clear language for everybody? Okay, for me, it's very important and uh, further to that is really to improve the dialogue. We wrote out the principles, but it's taken quite a long time to re-energize them. Obviously, as I've said, when everything is fine, debt is always in the back seat. <laughs> it's only left to the debt managers until there are these sort of uh, challenges. Um, so I, I would like to see that in the new revitalized rollout, you have um, uh, as, as a program um, stipulated timings when you'd want to bring those experts or bring those who are trying to implement to have a review and rediscuss um, than to take a very long time. Again, the issue of dialogue for me should also resolve the issue that Stephanie spoke to. We've seen quite a number of these soft uh, laws, the U, the G20, we have the UNCTAD. So when you are sitting in the debt office, you, you, it's not very clear whether these are overlapping or these are reinforcing each other. They, they're all out there. One day you are preparing a brief for the minister to go and discuss, he's going for a, a G20 principles of lending. The next day you want to discuss with him the principles from UNCTAD, he comes back to tell you which is which. So what should we go with? So for me, I think UNCTAD should take this role and appreciate that maybe they have a niche, consolidate these things so that all of us can be fitting into this one soft law across the various institutions. As it is now, it's been difficult. It's been difficult to know which principles really you want to run with vigorously or which ones you have to understand more than the other one because all of them have become useful at particular times in our debt management processes. So the appeal that strengthening the dialogue should also be looking at trying to uh, go towards one standard set of these soft laws that we can all put energy to. We can discuss them uh, periodically, reinforce them, and uh, do all the reviews that will be necessary. I think for me, that would have value that we look out for because when you are sitting, from a balance sheet point of view, you're trying to see what is valuable, what should take your time, what helps and what doesn't. So you find in that um, crunch time of various things to do, the principles take the back seat, yet they are the most important that should guide day to day undertaking. So maybe uh, not to eat so much into time, uh, process wise for me, I think you are spot on, there's diversity and uh, please ensure that all stakeholders are involved because at the end of the day, um, uh, you, you want also to get the review from all the stakeholders to really give a picture whether we have been on a journey to get somewhere or we seem to be on a journey that we need to keep moving and we will never know whether we have reached some place we at least achieved certain uh, mileage and so on. So again, all in all, uh, perfect uh, in terms of process, but process on its own is not helpful without having tangible outcomes. So I'm looking out at the revitalized principle to give us clear outcomes. I'm sorry to make uh, Jeff's analysis even easier because then we can see the traction. Have we been on the same road or we seem to go round and round, but somehow come back to the same road? So let me leave it at that. And uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for having me in the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. And thank you for your, um, your wise thoughts about how we could take practical steps to ensuring that indeed it is very clear um, that these principles um, are the principles by which um, debt management officers can really um, conduct their day-to-day -day work. So thank you for that. Um, I now turn um, with um, great pleasure to Mr. Wang Cheng. Uh, thank you for your patience. I know you're in Malaysia and the night is already, uh, has already fallen there. So thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to share some views on the principles of responsible sovereign lending and borrowing and how we utilize it and how do we meet it in Malaysia. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about Malaysian context. Let me just start by saying that I've gone through your 15 soft law guidelines. 
And I can, can confidently say that Malaysia has mostly adopted and adapted all of the eight principles relating to borrowers at the national policy level decision making. And also we have an existing uh, law on national debt limitation. So that covers that as well. And more importantly, we have some good news, which is the Malaysian government um, is now contemplating a new law, a bill called the Fiscal Responsibility Act. And they may pass it as early as uh, end of July or early, if later, it will be in the, in the budget period during December. But it is expected to be passed this year. Now, when this bill is passed, all eight principles for borrowers will be contained inside and therefore your soft law issue will become hard law in Malaysia. Yeah. So on that, on that note, what I want to do with this next eight minutes or so is to basically describe some of the policies that Malaysia has on the issue of sovereign debt and point out where these soft laws and guidelines have already been met, adopted and adapted. Yeah. So before we do that, now let me just give a short, very short introductory summary of what the Malaysian economy is in terms of the national debt situation. So you can get proper context to my following commentary. So the first thing you need to understand is Malaysia is a net borrower. So the eight principles of borrowing applies to us. Uh, Malaysia's national debt is currently at 70% of GDP. Now it, it's a bit high for a developing country but we are still able to maintain an A minus rating from Standard & Poor. Yeah? So as most of you are aware, Malaysia is a middle income nation. Uh, we have a very sophisticated banking and trade financing system. I know this because I used to be a corporate lawyer doing most of this stuff. Uh, we are also an evolving democracy with lots of challenges where governance is a big issue as most of you have heard of the 1MDB scandal. So while we have advanced system, we also tend to have problems within the system itself. But overall, we're relatively prosperous and we're a strong export-driven nation. Yeah? Now, part of the economic success is our ability to tap into international finances, finances from the 1980s. What has happened to Malaysia is in 1978-79, we discovered large deposits of oil. And we also, under Dr. Mahadeh's reign, he adopted neoliberal market economic policy and that, that combination makes us extremely bankable in a lot of the eyes of the lenders. Yeah? Now, this history being very bankable means that we have a lot of experience in borrowings. Uh, and also, we've, heard, we've learned some very hard lessons, in particular during the Asian financial crisis of 97. Yeah? And the ability to borrow cuts both ways because we had very, very high-speed growth. Uh, what China is experiencing the last 10 years, we had it in the 1990s. Uh, you know, and it, it creates both an issue of being de dependent on borrowing. Uh, so we've been having perpetual deficit since 1997. So what we really concerns us if we, we leave this unchecked, if we don't fix our taxation system, if we don't, you know, list Petronas, or we don't do some major asset, uh, you know, restructuring, these loans may become unsustainable within about 10 to 15 years. Yeah, because we are oil producing nation, we are shockingly near, nowhere near being Norway, uh, but you know, we're stuck in a position of 70% of GDP as national debt, okay? Uh, but more importantly, to understand Malaysian politics carefully and the, the economic system, we really have to understand the national debt is linked to, unfortunately, some form of crony capitalism system that we still have to a certain degree today, yeah? As I said earlier, I used to be a corporate lawyer. So in the early 1990s, I was already practicing. Uh, so what I'm going to comment about comes partly from my work as a corporate lawyer and also as, as a legislator since, 19, uh, since 2013. And I'm also the head of public policy and economics for my party. And I sit in the select committee of economy and finance. So let's quickly go to the basic policy decisions that Malaysia has. And how does it impact the soft law guidelines or how have we adopted and adapted this? The first thing you need to understand Malaysian core policy on borrowing is that the government can only borrow money for developmental spending. So I don't know how you guys organize your budget, but in Malaysia, we have operational spending and developmental spending. Operational spending has to be paid by government revenue. So for our colleagues from developing countries, I would highly suggest you adopt this similar policy 
so that we don't fall foul of the, the principle of not over borrowing under the soft law guideline. Yeah. So key point is that we, uh, for operations like to pay wages of civil servant, it has to be raised by taxation and internally generated dividends from government linked companies. We can only borrow for development. Yeah. Now, having said that, that is the sacrosanct rule. And from, from having that basic principle, I think Malaysia has managed to avoid over excessive borrowing. Now, the second thing is to, to emphasize again that Malaysia has a long experience of borrowing money, sovereign debt. So we have a wide range of tools for borrowings as well, right? The primary tool for Malaysia, I, I think like what Jacob has said, I, I'm sure uh, Zambia also does the same. That is we issue government bonds. And I think that's the standard system that most of us do when you want to raise government debt or to raise some money for the government. Now, the issuance of government bond is quite unique in Malaysia in the sense that we use local banks to assist the government professionally and to advise them and organize the bond issuance. Now, the banks do it as a national service where they charge very minimal to raise this kind of bonds. In the case of the 1NDB scandal, we the government you know, utilize Goldman Sachs and they charge the hell a lot more as a percentage for, this, for, for the bond issuance. So being very careful if you are really trying to manage your bond situation, engage a local Malaysian bank or local, local bank to do the bond issuance. And by doing that, uh, you know, you will get the confidence of the market. Therefore, you solve principle number nine on binding agreement, principle 10 on market transparency, principle 11 disclosure. So, and then these bonds are then sold in the open market. Yeah, Where possible, Malaysia tries to avoid project financing. Now, I'm from the opposition. So, you know, for us, a simple red flag is when the government pursues project financing, then we assume that there are going to be governance issues. Yeah. So in the most recent case in, in, uh, in Malaysia is the financing of a, is of a train project, a railway project called the ECRL. Now that involves a, giant, a, a big uh, SOE from China yeah, to do a railroad project. Now, the, the costing came up to 60 billion ringgit. Yeah? When the government lost power and the opposition took over for 22 months, that costing was reduced down to 44 billion. So you can imagine that you know, some level of transparency and accountability is greatly required in Malaysia, even though we have a history of financing and borrowing. Yeah? So project financing is frowned upon. Another typical source of project financing is what we call the PFI version or the PPP, the public-private partnerships. Those involves concession, and that unfortunately is mostly linked to the idea that this kind of borrowings, because the government acts as a guarantor mostly, so it's an indirect borrowing, are linked to some form of crony capitalism with long-term concession. So that's also under the radar for opposition MPs to look out for. Let me go back to the bond issuance that the Malaysian government do. Then we can show you how do we manage to keep ourselves relatively safe, even though we issue quite a lot of bonds. The first thing we do is we prioritize the local uh, pension fund and the banks to take up most of these government issues. Yeah. Now, this seems a bit strange, but Malaysia, essentially, what we do is we, we suffered during the 1997 currency crash and the, the great financial crash is because we were overexposed in our bond issuance as well as general equities and corporate bonds, uh, where you know, once the currency tanked, it was too expensive for us to pay. Therefore, that triggered a collapse of the economic system. So what the government has done is they've realized if you issue too many bonds, you should prioritize giving it to local people that you can you know, possibly pressure a bit for them to do national service, to raise finance. Yeah. So the, the priority should be for local sources of uh, local people to take up the financial uh, bonds that, that the government issue. Second thing is we do a mix of US and Malaysian ringgit currencies as a hedge, but we also try to limit the US denominated bonds to around 25% of issuance. Yeah. So when you have US denominated issuance uh, bonds, then you have to make sure that the US currency reserves to deter further speculation, speculative attacks since like 1997, uh, you have to have at least a decent amount of reserve and we use about six months 
of imports as a good guide on US currency. Yeah. So those are the things that the Malaysian government try its best to monitor and to, to ensure that we don't go overboard. Uh, we also try to limit exposure to foreign holdings, as I said earlier. Uh, Malaysian pension fund and Malaysian banks are told to, to buy on national service ground to protect the Malaysian uh, bonds. But we do allow foreigners to take up. It depends on market demand, but roughly is around less than 10% of all our bonds are in foreign hands. Yeah. Now, uh, going back to another issue on project financing. Uh, when I was a lawyer, we did project financing for corporations. It's the same for government as well. Uh, you have to make sure that the economic multiplier from such project actually is the costing is spot on. You know, what we have is a tendency to mark up the cost by 30% because the project, while, while it's funded by, the, by anybody, it only covers about 70% of the total thing. So what they do is they mark up the project cost by another 30% so that they get full 100% coverage on, on the borrowing. Yeah, but we have to be we have to be mindful and we've got to monitor this kind of thing. And more importantly, we have to ensure that if whatever project financing comes from a sovereign states such as China recently, that at least 50%, if not more, of the project work goes directly to benefit local engineers and local experts. Okay, so those are the basic core principles that the Malaysian government uses to try to manage and to make sure that we can at least be able to pay back this amount. Now, the, the limitation that I spoke on spoke about earlier touched upon, where we say that the, there is a law, existing law, is in the Finance Act of Malaysia, that if you want to increase the national debt, you have to go to parliament and get approval. Now, this is really important. I think most developing countries should learn this and use this concept because every politician, you know, I'm a politician myself, but every politician wants to spend, right? But every politician is also aware if you borrow too much and you go to parliament, you debate about the issue of raising the limitation to the board, to the, to the debt level, then the public will say that your government is trying to drive it to bankruptcy. And that is a political problem for any government. So having this basic policy of ensuring that if you want to increase the national debt limit, you come to parliament and debate and get approval will then you know, prevent politicians from being excessively gung-ho in borrowing more and more money. Yeah. Now, there are also improvements that we need to do. Of course, like most uh, countries around the world, it is important that the monitoring job of this kind of thing should be given to the central bank. Yeah. We are also proposing at many level to consider to allow the central central bank to do feasibility study of mega projects, so that they have a final say on it. Not the Ministry of Finance, who are politicians, but the central bank, who are supposed to be independent, to have a say and a veto power on feasibility of projects. Once the 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 feasibility phase is done and it clears, then the central bank should not get involved in 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 the financing element of it. But at least for the feasibility part. The, the level of debt, the level of payment, repayment, I think the central bank is probably the best body to get in. Of course, parliament can also do, which we do. Uh, I sit in the Finance and Economy Select Committee. I'm the deputy chairman. We do call the central bank from time to time to brief us on the national debt level. And we have we've had to do it during COVID-19. And we are most likely have to do it facing stagflation in the next six, six months or so. Yeah. Uh, as for the rest, I wonder if you could just bring it to the end now. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I, I just want to say that uh, when it comes to just to recap the whole thing, when it comes to meeting these guidelines, I think Malaysia is really ahead of the curve. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges, right? So what we really need to push is more transparency issue. And because things are very complicated, the best way to do it is to push it most of these bonds and government issuance to banks to do it on our behalf, the private sector. Yeah? Engage the rating agencies more uh, in terms of macroeconomics and, and how to increase our taxation and make sure that we are able to generate income from these economic multipliers. Then we need to work closer with the World Bank and, and, and even IMF to some extent and, and the, the Chinese banks. Uh, you know, so Malaysia is using a multiple to approach to do, do this kind of thing. But most, most importantly, I just want to say that when we do pass this law, I will be happy to come back and share with you 
how have we solidified your eight principles into actual legislation? Thank you very much for the time. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to take part and I, I'm looking forward to, you know, engaging you further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wong Chen. And indeed, thank you to all the participants in this previous panel. Um, it's been really interesting to see the interaction between these principles that were designed, the ways in which they have been implemented in some cases, um, how they become soft law um, and guidance principles in some places and in others may well become legislated. Um, I think um, certainly Mr. Wong Chen also um, had some very strong ideas about um, how countries should engage with sovereign lending. Um, thank you for uh, giving us your, your time and your thoughts and to you too, Mr. Nkandawiri, um, speaking to us about how there are practical steps in which we can actually extend the principles on, on responsible sovereign lending and borrowing into debt offices. So thank you very much. I'm going to draw this session to a close. Um, the next session starts hot on the heels. Um, could I ask that we just, with your indulgence, have a four minute break. We will start the next session at 16.05. And um, that will be the session where we discuss um, the Sustainable Development Finance Assessment. Um, this is work that um, has been produced within the project. Um, and we will have Daniela who, Pratis, who will be moderating for us. So thank you very much until five past four.
Good afternoon uh, and good morning for those in Latin America and the evening for those in Asia. Uh, it's a pleasure to moderate this section on the Sustainable Development Finance Framework, uh, one of the tools uh, developed uh, uh, within this project. Uh, and um, in the discussion, we will have four uh, presenters. Uh, firstly, uh, Penelope Hawkins uh, was the project leader and is, our, is a senior economic affairs officer uh, at the debt and development fi finance branch of UNCTAD. will set in the scene for the discussion uh, after uh, Gustav Buberi uh, that developed the framework with uh, uh, Carlos Schonewald will present the, the main features of the SDFA. Um, uh, after uh, Gustavo give, um, sorry, the, the name Cliff Lockwood uh, will that apply uh, the SDFA under uh, other project, the BRI project, uh, also um, uh, coordinated by uh, in, the, uh, in our division, the Division of Globalization Development Strategy. Uh, he applied the SDFA for Sri Lanka and Indonesia and developed a policy uh, a dashboard for policymakers. And then it was uh, he will show how the SDFA could be useful, uh, is really a useful tool for, for policymakers. And to finalize the session, um, Nelson Barbosa will, uh, that was one of the referees uh, of the framework, uh, will talk about the usefulness uh, of the SDFA uh, in general, but especially in the current situation when uh, developing countries are facing uh, increasing uh, external constraints uh, linked to uh, real and financial uh, uh, issues. Uh, then, as we don't have <laughs> much time, let's uh, start uh, with um, Penelope Hawkins. The floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to just share my screen. Um, I think it will help guide us through. Um, if you just bear with me one minute. Um, I want to move to the... Um, for some reason I can't access the slide show. Um, why is that being difficult? Um, um, I take it you can see it? Yes, perfect. Same. Thank you so much. So, um, thank you so much, Daniela. And uh, I think perhaps just as I start, um, I would really like to take this moment to thank Daniela uh, and Gustavo Bering and Carla Schoenewelt, um, the three external reviewers who were Nelson Barbosa, Christopher Tor, and Tuan Godan, um, and Keith Lockwood, who uh, did a lot of the empirical work around testing this, this framework, and indeed, the many um, individuals who one way or another within the UNCTAD framework um, and within our branch um, who've actually given us feedback and helped develop what is a brand new process um, and so therefore is still um, nascent in some ways. So allow me to just step through the, um, the presentation very briefly. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction. I think perhaps um, clearly one knows that um, just in the same way that there were uh, uh, foundational causes that existed, systemic problems that existed in developing countries prior to the COVID crisis that were exacerbated by the pandemic, our thinking, of course, around things like sustain debt sustainability and how structural transformation can be achieved within the framework of debt sustainability and indeed the achievement of the SDGs 
has, of course, been with us for some time. And we were doing work prior to the pandemic, examining how, for example, a subset of 30 developing countries who are lower income, lower middle income and upper middle income countries could achieve the first four SDGs. Given their current debt levels, uh, with a view to saying let's not worsen them, how would it be that they could actually achieve the, the first four SDGs? And the work that was done here, um, particularly within the branch, was that there was uh, an assumption made that we could, let's first of all examine the possibility of no uh, improvement in external financing, um, apart from, say, concessional finance. Um, and then what would, what would be the situation for these 30 countries? And basically, it was very clear that if we were trying to, just on the basis of no additional uh, external financing, achieve the SDGs for these 30 countries, their public debt GDP ratios would actually rise between 50 and 185% by 2013. And you can see this um, scenario here um, graphically. And then if there was no external financing again, and then a requirement that said no increase uh, on public debt to, to GDP ratios, then in fact, countries would have to achieve an, an annual average growth rate of 12%. Now, clearly neither of these scenarios was remotely realistic. Um, and so that of course brings into the question, so what can be done? How does one actually achieve um, external financing requirements and uh, public uh, debt sustainability. And this is where the, the project provided this uh, possibility of developing the SDFA framework. Now, our key point of departure um, is to analyze how developing countries um, can achieve structural tra transformation together with the SDGs. Um, and here we're just looking at the first four SDGs again, no poverty, no hunger, uh, good health, quality education, um, with a view to um, seeing this as the beginnings of trying to develop a, a framework in which one a, a country can try to transform structurally at the same time take cognizance of their external position. Now, this is somewhat of a difference from standard debt sustainability and assessments because traditionally they would look at the financial needs um, associated with servicing existing sovereign debt. And we're saying, yes, you must service the existing sovereign debt, but how do you, with, at the same time, achieve structural transformation? We heard today, for example, Professor Jeddah pointing out that in Ethiopia, something like uh, two thirds of their um, export earnings go into servicing uh, external debt. So this is the kind of uh, problems that we are trying to deal with. We also know that causality runs in typically in small open economies, we assume that the causality runs from the external account because theoretically we think that for developing countries, the balance of payments provides the most relevant constraint. And then we are looking really at a long run solvency issue. Um, the ability of a country to service their stock of net external um, liabilities. The theoretical framework is based on the work of Caldor and Thurwell, Doma and Pazanetti and Bering. So what are the underpinnings of this model? Well, first of all, just to briefly frame this balance of payments constraint issue. This is something that is always associated with Tony Thurwell. He pointed out that balance of payments uh, situation can constrain growth in open economies where the seeds of the recession really exist because of an over-reliance on imports. And this is especially important in the case of countries reliant on imported capital and intermediate goods. So as you um, grow, you need more of those capital and intermediate goods. And as a consequence, you then have to service uh, your balance of payments. So in the UNCTAD SDFA, causality runs from the balance of payments constraint. That establishes an upper bound for long-term growth and hence for long run sustainability for the public sector and investment into SDGs. Um, in more conventional models, it's always the prices that adjust unless there's some kind of spanner in the works. But in this case, 
um, we see this balance of payments constraint as if, act, if it's providing an upper bound, uh, which then influences long-term growth. And indeed, this idea was muted long before Sobel. Um, certainly, Raoul Prebish, who was, as you know, the first um, executive secretary or secretary general of UNCTAD, um, he always spoke about uh, the role of foreign direct investment. The problem there, he pointed out, was as the stock of foreign capital increases, so too does the servicing cost, which again demands an increasing proportion of resources from exports. And so the more the proportion of those services grow, the less there will be room for importing capital goods. So this is the sort of first leg, if you like, of our process. The second is the under, the second underpinning is the need to achieve some kind of internal sustainability. Now, this is where we rely on the work from Pazanetti. Um, here, uh, Pazanetti worked to try and really look at government deficit and debt for six European nations at the end of the 90s. And really, his point of reference was the Maastricht Treaty, where two, um, two ratios really governed uh, European countries. And the first ratio, of course, was a 3% government deficit ratio, the second, the 60% for the debt ratio. And as he pointed out, that if you are applying them both, then of course, there's only one possible combination uh, at which the country can operate. Now, the UNTAD SDFA, SDFA is to assume that in fact, um, the, that is somewhat unrealistic for most de developing countries. And indeed, to assume that there are many um, policy recommendations when countries are unsustainable, are there various combinations of macroeconomic and development policy, um, and one of them is fiscal austerity, but it's really not the only one. And that, of course, is, again, a key departure from other conventional models where fiscal austerity to achieve public debt sustainability is often the logical conclusion of the model. Now, I just, in the next few slides, I'm going to go very quickly through um, some Pazanetti points that has been produced by Chris Tor, who was one of the uh, original reviewers of the model. Um, and so what I found very useful about these Pazanetti points that he produced um, just to examine the effect of where countries were in 2010. I know these slides are uh, perhaps a little bit unclear, but there's a yellow dot for 2010. That's where the country was in terms of um, it's change in um, net in internal liabilities or the public sector um, net liabilities um, as we have it in the SDFA model. And then, of course, just looking at the debt uh, to, if you like, the debt to GDP ratio, which is on the horizontal axis. That little yellow point in 2010 for Italy, for example, you can see where that point is relative to the Maastricht edict, and you can see that it's not operating there. In fact, its deficit is too high, and indeed its debt to GDP ratio is too high. Then there's a thin red line which follows year by year where Italy was in those um, internal sustainability points, you might say, or Pazanetti points, and it gets to 2019 in the green dot. The red dot or the pink dot right at the top is what happens to the country after COVID. And I think we have been talking about this project in the context of COVID. And I think it's useful for us to just see that the foundational points of the model that we are developing um, very clearly show the impact of COVID for a number of countries. For example, here is um, Italy again with Germany and with France. And in each case, although you can see Germany follows a slightly different trajectory, um, from 2010, it reduces both its debt and its uh, public deficit, but by 2020, it too has, if you like, a sort of a, a U or a V curve going out uh, the, the data for France again, it managed to reduce its deficit, um, but not necessarily its level of debt, which increased, but after COVID, you have these um, massive indications of how difficult it was for countries to remain within fiscal rules. Now we have um, a few additional countries, also the United Kingdom, Belgium, Spain, Daniel, all of them. Sorry, but if you could wrap up. Yes, I will <laughs> right away, sorry. Thank you so much. 
I just wanted to show you the three countries that we've done, three of the developing countries. Again, you can see they haven't been very good at perhaps reducing either the deficit or debt, but indeed the COVID effect is also shown. Now, what was the SDFA logic? Um, just very briefly, um, the idea was that you have to have a look at countries' repayment capacity. And we, in order to do that, we've looked at exports plus remittances. These are free of cost. And for a given trade deficit, the rate of growth of export needs to be higher than the cost of servicing the net external liabilities. Once you actually have that nest international investment position, you then have a long run sustainability that impacts then the public sector in the long run. Now the components of the SDFA are really very interesting. I think this is a really novel area because it's not only looking at the external financial stability, if you like the third world story, um, and not only the public sector financial stability, if you like the Pazanetti story, but it combines them to, the, two of, the two of them together. I'm going to finish with this slide. I think there are some limitations and advances of the model. We know that like any model, it's a simplification of a complex world. It is theoretical work in progress. We know that the work that um, Gustavo and Carlos, uh, Gustavo in particular, has made us think differently and is taking us into new avenues. And for that, we are um, very, very, um, I, I can, uh, have a lot of acknowledgement and, and gratefulness. Um, but we've also had to take it into empirical work as reflected in country studies and the policy dashboard board. And that too is work that has been significant and is still ongoing. I think the thing that we can say about this project is that it's got a development focus. It believes that spending on the SDGs can result in an alternative future. And it tries to include expenditure on SDGs explicitly in its fiscal decision-making. It uh, is allows for most a more inclusive system, both on the external side and indeed on the public side. And it potentially provides more insights into policy alternatives for developing countries. It's work that we will continue to extend in 2022 and beyond. And I thank you for your time. Many thanks, Penelope, for this overview and summary uh, of the SDFA. Then now, uh, Gustavo Berry, uh, I already mentioned that uh, was uh, the, uh, the co consultant, the main consultant that developed uh, the model, and this uh, professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil. Then uh, Gustavo will give us uh, more details um, of the model and also uh, talk about some policy implications. Um, and uh, Gustavo will have uh, 50 minutes, uh, then the floor is yours. Uh, okay, Daniela, thank you. Uh, let me first try to share my screen here. Okay, I believe it's, can you all see the, the, the presentation? Okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Unted uh, for inviting me for this web webinar, uh, especially the Debt and Development Finance Branch, uh, and all the organizers of this webinar, and um, and also especially Daniela, who worked uh, closely with us in the development of the SDFA, with many important co contributions uh, for the uh, development of the, the framework. So I'll try to uh, explain a little, little bit in more detail uh, following Penelope's uh, presentation. Um, well. First of all, a sort of brief overview on the, the framework, as Penelope uh, already put it, it's, uh, it's a framework to evaluate countries developing finance needs in order to achieve long run SDGs uh, in view of the external finance and public sector sustainability. And uh, since the, uh, the achievement of these SDGs are in general is in general connected with the, uh, the need for a public investment, uh, this has, of course, impact on fiscal policy and also on public sector debt and external debt. So uh, the question here is, is to is, is to try to 
coordinates uh, long run sustainability with the achievement of SDGs and the uh, sustainability for us here following uh, Domer's discussion uh, is sort of a synonym for long run solvency in the, within this framework. So we're treating here sustainability as a synonym for long run uh, solvency, both on external accounts and for the uh, public sector account. Um, so as Penelope put it, there are two main um, aspects here, uh, which differs our framework, the SDFA framework from uh, the SA mainstream approaches, alternative approaches to this uh, question with the first one is that the achievement of SDGs is at the center of the analysis here. So uh, it goes beyond uh, the mere uh, assessment of debt, but also the more the broader dimension of external finance sustainability. So this is the first point here. And uh, a more uh, theoretical point is that uh, long run growth is demand led and the balance of payments represents through the relative constraint, as Penelope said, uh, for countries that, of course, do not issue an international currency, which for a long time is predominantly the US dollar. Right? So uh, the idea here is that uh, for the public sector sustainability, uh, it is it is subject to the external constraint. And once we evaluate the external constraint, we combine it with the public sector sustainability in order to have an, an overall framework to evaluate the achievement of long run SDGs with fiscal policy, public investment, and so on. So for the for, so we, we begin with the external side of, of the, the framework. Um, the, our reference here, our theoretical references here, uh, which fall within a post Keynesian tradition, of course, the Caldor Thurwell models, which of course uh, I, call, I call it Caldor Thurwell, but it's some sort of Herod, Prebish, Caldor Thurwell models, uh, long run tradition on, on external constraints. Uh, some of the, the reference here and uh, the work for, for that sustainability in general. We follow uh, the contributions of Domer and Pazinetti and uh, uh, by recent contributions of uh, contribution of mine with professors Franklin Serrano and Fabio Freitas on the specific uh, currency mismatch issues on these kind of models. So this is the overall uh, theoretical reference we have here. So the uh, the problem of long run solvency here is uh, the possibility of an overall scarcity of foreign currency. Okay. Uh, thus, we have to compare uh, the uh, relation between total external liabilities and total external assets with some sort of flow that measures this uh, repayment capacity. For the, the, the relationship between liabilities and assets here, we simply uh, use the negative value of the net international investment positions and call it simply net external liabilities or NEL in the framework. But for the repayment capacity, we consider two key elements here. And uh, Penelope talked a little bit about it. Uh, the, um, the main um, feature that these flows must have is that they must represent some sort of free of cost inflow of foreign currency in the current account. So the, the two uh, Inflows be considered for the first one, of course, is most uh, uh, used one exports of goods and services. But we also, as Daniela pointed out in, uh, in during our discussions, that one important inflow of uh, free of cost inflow of foreign currencies is also remittances. And we, for simplicity in the framework, we consider remittances here simply as the compensation of employees in the primary income account and the uh, personal transfers in the secondary income account. So. We uh, consider this as repayment capacity, these uh, augmented exports, which is simply the sum of exports of goods and services and remittances. Okay. Uh, the basic accounting of the model I try to, of course, to simplify it as much as, as, I, as I can. Uh, simply, we start from the <clears throat> conventional balance of payments account, uh, which is a, an accounting identity, and uh, but in order to connect this, uh, these flows on the balance of payments with the uh, stocks of net external liabilities. This, frameworks of, uh, this framework, of course, must guarantee that it is stock flow consistent. And uh, what it means in, in our context here is that it must relate the variations in stocks, the net external liabilities, not only 
with the balance of payments flows, but also with the uh, holding gains, which uh, which represent here asset and liability prices changes. <clears throat> so uh, from this accounting and uh, and considering the stock flow consistency, separating price of of asset and liability changes from the the flows, <clears throat> we arrive at a uh, sustainability condition for the external accounts. It simply, can be uh, uh, can be uh, represented by this sort of equation here, which is simply that the adjusted trade deficit, and by adjusted trade deficit here, I mean the, uh, the some sort of trade deficit, which uh, uh, includes the remittances in augmented exports and some uh, residual components of the secondary income accounts. So they simply call it adjusted to in order to differentiate from the conventional trade deficit. So the adjusted trade deficit over augmented exports equals what we call the snowball effect, uh, which simply represents the uh, the relation between the uh, average cost of, of NEL, of net external liabilities, uh, which we, in the, in the framework, we include holding gains, uh, and the growth rate of augmented exports. So uh, we could think that the, the this cost, this average uh, net cost, uh, include, for for instance, uh, interest interest payments on external debt. So this is the snowball effect, the pure effect of growing uh, NEL over augmented exports stemming from its cost. And uh, we multiply the snowball effect by the level of our indicator. So the level of NEL over augmented exports. So uh, our indicator, the NEL over augmented exports might increase <clears throat> uh, for two reasons. First one is the is the pure snowball effect. And the second one is the creation of increasing uh, deficit. So this relation we, we just just see just saw here uh, entails that in the presence of an adjusted trade deficit, the growth rate of augmented exports must be greater than the average cost of average net cost of NEL. And also, which is a more traditional uh, condition related to thorough models, that imports must grow as fast as augmented exports, which we use here as a repayment capacity. Uh, and, uh, and also following Pazinetti, uh, we can interpret this uh, stability condition here as some sort of menu choice between the, the flows, adjusted trade deficit, and stocks, the level of NEL over augmented exports. So there is a relationship between flows and stocks here, which creates this sort of area of sustainability. Okay, so the, the condition that, that, the, uh, that NEL over export uh, augmented exports be stable in the long run or does not grow indefinitely create this sort of of, of bound boundary here which below this boundary have a area of sustainability and below and within this area of sustainability we may have uh, different combinations of adjusted trade deficits and uh, a level of nail over augmented exports so some sort of menu choice okay. so this is the external accounts part Going to the public sector, just a few points here. We consider public, public sector, federal, state, municipal administration, central banks, state enterprises and banks. Uh, and also as the, uh, as the uh, sustainability indicator here for the public sector, we use simply the public sector net liabilities, PSNL over GDP, which is the traditional uh, repayment capacity flow used here. Of course, we could use perhaps uh, tax revenues, but following Domer's uh, uh, work, we sim simplify this repayment capacity simply as GDP, which is the traditional flow here. So basic accounting of the framework, uh, we consider that government spending is financed by four main four uh, components, which, which are tax revenues, uh, variation in monetary base, variation in net public internal debt, and variation in net public external debt. Okay. And of course, uh, as we did with the external accounts, model the the framework must be a stock flow consistent so here we have to account our the variations in in stocks for the uh, the inflation okay and on asset and liability so we simply treat it as uh, stock flow consistent including inflation in the model and we arrive at a similar uh, sustainability condition for the public sector where we have the primary fiscal deficit over gdp equals Again, the snowball effect times the uh, uh, PSNL over GDP, which is our indicator 
for uh, long run sustainability or long run solvency. And the, the snowball effect again represents the, the average net cost of this um, net liabilities discounted for inflation, of course, and uh, the uh, rate of growth of output. Okay, so since here, um, output or GDP represents the repayment capacity, its rate of growth, which appears in the snowball effect now. Uh, so this net cost of, of, of public sector net liabilities uh, might include, for example, the policy rate set by central banks. Okay? So uh, this just for an example of what we mean here by the uh, snowball effect. Um, and uh, we arrive at, at one, one condition here for the public sector that in the presence of a primary fiscal deficit, the rate of growth of GDP must be greater than the average net cost of public sector net liabilities, which is similar to the condition we arrived at for the external account. Uh, and uh, also here, the sustainability condition for the public sector can also fall in positivity be interpreted as a menu choice between flows and stocks. We are having a similar uh, relation here, with uh, which is a schedule of a, a straight line. Below that line, we have the area of sustainability, <clears throat> where different combinations of uh, primary fiscal deficit and uh, public sector net liabilities over GDP, <clears throat> we, have, we can have different combinations between those two. And uh, so then once we have these two stability conditions for the external accounts for the public sector, we, we can combine those two. And uh, the way we combine it is simply, we say that, okay, so the for demand-led, uh, uh, the demand-led setting here for developing economies, the, the balance of payments constraint is the most relative economic constraint on growth, okay? Uh, and the second condition we, we discussed for the uh, external accounts that imports must grow as fast as augmented exports entail that uh, we have a specific rate of growth of output, which is compatible with these external accounts, which we simply call GBP. And so there is a associated with this condition, there is a, a specific, uh, uh, this condition yields a specific rate of growth. So we simply pick the, the, this rate of growth uh, and we, apply this to the, our public sector sustainability. So we simply we are simply looking at the public sector sustainability now as uh, what if the uh, uh, which are the conditions for public sector sustainability given that the country's rate of growth is constrained uh, uh, by the external accounts. Okay? Uh, so this is the sort of questions we are asking here. And of course this will lead to uh, uh, another uh, area of sustainability, is which, which can change uh, regarding the relation between the actual rate of growth G and the rate of growth compatible with external accounts. So it might change the, high, uh, the, the size of the area of the sustainability area, which of course impacts the different combinations between primary fiscal uh, deficit, primary fiscal balance and uh, public sector net liabilities over GDP. Uh, so, <clears throat> just to wrap up here, there's some, of course, some policy implications that uh, on for the public sector, we uh, the, the achievement of S, uh, SDGs rely heavily on public investment. So uh, there's, of course, a, a discussion. We we do a brief discussion. We, we are we are in the in the works of developing this policy implications. But of course, the fiscal and monetary policy play play a key role here in attaining these goals in the long run. Uh, looking specifically at the uh, the, uh, the public sector, but also at the same time um, for the external accounts, some policies that promote exports and also policies that aim to reduce the import dependence also matter to decrease the balance of payments constraints. So it's a it's a um, uh, sort of com combination that the economy must invest or that must make public investment spending, but also it's con it is constrained by the balance of payments accounts. And also we have some implications for uh, in the very empirical work, uh, which Keith will, will, will talk about after my, my presentation, about how we can use this, these conditions, we can use this model in order to look at the data, look at uh, the situation of different developing countries and try to assess how, uh, how, they, how well or how bad the, the situation for sustainability is and what is the policy space 
in order to work with the achievement of long run SDGs. So this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Uh, 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, so difficult to speak exactly uh, the, 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 the minutes that we, we have. Um, thank you very much. Um, regarding only one, one brief comment, uh, your last um, slide, uh, that to, to emphasize how the SDFA uh, uh, is, is linked, Penelope mentioned that briefly, with the need of structural transformation, developing countries, because it's exactly that that will um, affect the export composition, import composition, and uh, then uh, alleviate, reduce the balance of payment uh, constraints, though related to this, your uh, last uh, point. And uh, how the SDFA, uh, we already uh, applied, né? Keith uh, Lockwood will show us some um, uh, the results of his uh, work. And we uh, saw uh, already uh, seen uh, with this, have already seen with these uh, applications how the framework uh, could be useful for policymakers in, in developing countries. Then uh, Keith Lockwood uh, is an independent consultant that, as I mentioned, has uh, worked at, as a consultant for uh, two projects of UNCTAD, and uh, here he then he will. Uh, I mentioned this project, the, the COVID and other project on the BRI, uh, and uh, will present for us then the, the results uh, of his um, empirical application to Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Uh, Keith, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela, um, and good afternoon, evening, and morning to everyone, all the participants. Um, it's certainly a great pleasure for me to uh, share the results of this exercise. Um, as Carlos indicated, or sorry, uh, as uh, Gustavo indicated, um, I was sort of tasked with taking the model and now trying to apply it to specific countries. So we were moving out of the theoretical realm into some sort of practical application. And uh, in the process, I thought it might be useful to develop some kind of a, um, a sort of a dashboard approach where you could see the impact of different policy choices and economic developments almost in real time on the levels of sustainability Specifically, um, I focused on the, the, the external sustainability and the uh, integrated sustainability. The two countries that I focused on were first, first and foremost um, Indonesia, which for the most part has been a country that uh, hasn't had particularly significant um, uh, debt sustainability issues. Um, and then Secondly, Sri Lanka, where we know uh, the situation has turned quite serious um, in recent times. So what I'm going to do is share the screen and then I will um, just go through the key elements of the dashboard. All right, so hopefully you can see here the... Um, I've worked in, in accordance with a historical application. So some of those Passanetti points that um, Penelope referred to in her presentation are effectively reflected here. So the historical application is um, in, in, uh, shown in, in sort of gray uh, dots and the numbers inside those dots reflect particular years. And then we have a, a, a two forward-looking scenarios in effect. The first scenario is what we call the baseline scenario. And in that situation, we assume that the kind of averages that uh, pertain during the history period are now extended into the future. And then, um, so, so those, are, those, those are colored in a sort of uh, pinky red, and we are looking forward over a 10 year period, um, in other words, in this case, from 2021 to 2031. 
essentially those those two elements of the models and, and are um, are locked for adjustment, so they are the function of history. Um, the third element then is what we call an alternative scenario, where you now get to choose and to play around with specific ratios and elements of the model, so that um, you can see what impact particular policy choices would make. So. Um, and those are those are done in blue. The external constraint is is in the center, and that follows the sort of um, principal approach that says we um, that especially for low income and developing countries, it is the external constraint that's really the binding constraint on on their ability to move forward. Um, and then the the um, uh, graph on the right shows the integrated constraint, which is essentially from the perspective of the, the various dots. Um, so both the, the, the sort of historic and baseline and alternative scenarios, those would all be the same as the public sector constraint. Um, but after that, we could, um, uh, the, the key difference will be in terms of the area of uh, integrated financial uh, sustainability which is affected by um, uh, the, the external constraint, if you like. So the, the gradient of the, the boundary condition in the right-hand graph changes in accordance with the developments on the external accounts. Okay, so if we take a, a starting point, you'll see here, so historically Indonesia uh, was operating well within its um, area of external sustainability. Um, and you could make the point in some cases that it was operating so far within that area of sustainability that it could have afforded to grow at a faster rate. And in other words, import more. Um, that would have moved some of those years uh, in gray closer towards the boundary condition. Um, so if we start out and, and, and uh, just uh, some of the key variables to which the model is, is quite sensitive are obviously things like the import propensity. So if you change the propensity to import from something that is close to what it was historically, and maybe you increase that to, I'm just going to say 28%, um, then you see suddenly that the uh, that Indonesia, if it suddenly was uh, importing 28% of its GDP or the equivalent in value, it would move out of a an area where it is uh, sustainable into an unsustainable area. Um, if you reduce that to 20% and then increase your exports, uh, and then you get a, a kind of quite a different outcome. So that's the, the sort of key issues. Then uh, Gustavo mentioned the augmented exports. So the other elements of, of exports would be the um, compensation of employees in the primary account, and a primary income account, and the personal transfers in the secondary income account. So if you change assumptions around what rate of growth those two components will uh, enjoy, then you get different outcomes. So these are, are less significant and sensitive in the case of Indonesia, but they become more uh, significant in the case of uh, Sri Lanka, for example. And then a key variable that affects the area of sustainability and the boundary condition would obviously be what is the cost of net external liability. So, um, at the moment, it's set at something close to their historic average. But if you were to reduce this significantly, let's say to 3%, then you suddenly see that the area of external financial sustainability increases substantially. And basically, that means that there's the policymakers would have a lot more policy space to operate in. When it comes to the public sector, um, the key assumptions here around uh, levels of, of growth in government spending. Um, so if you, if you were to historically Indonesia increased its um, government spending by about 10 and a half percent a year over the 2010, 2021 period. Um, if you 
reduce that to 5%, then you see in the right-hand graph, it has certain impacts. Uh, the second line is really making provision for uh, new government priorities. So those could be the, the SDGs that um, Gustavo was referring to. Increasingly now, it could also be the green agenda uh, and climate change. So here we can make provision for additional government spending as a percent of GDP. Um, so if you were to up, in the case of Indonesia, for them to achieve their their uh, SDG targets one to four by 2030, the estimate was they would need to spend about 4.1% of um, GDP in addition to what they're really spending. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so that, that ramps up um the situation there's a feedback mechanism because as you spend more in, in terms of government there's also an assumption around the the import propensity that goes hand in hand with that and then another key element of this would be um what is the the revenue to gdp ratio um so if you had a situation where revenue collapsed as it did under COVID, for example then you could suddenly see this dropping quite significantly and again, you'd see um, particular limitations. The graph on the right-hand side, those two red lines reflect um, fiscal rules. So in Indonesia's case, they have um, a deficit, essentially the Maastricht conditions apply. So 3% deficit and a 60% debt ratio. You'll see in Sri Lanka's case, that's a little bit different. Um, so the critical thing in terms of the assumptions we've made, uh, the sustainable, the, the, the GBP growth rate at the bottom on the left-hand side, you'll see is sitting at 3.4%. That means that uh, Sri um, in Indonesia could afford under these assumptions to grow uh, sustainably at a rate of about 3.4%. Um, and the rate at which it's actually projected to grow in under these assumptions is about 3.2%. So those are sort of aligned. I'm just gonna stop sharing this screen quickly and convert to or go over to the Sri Lankan story. Okay, so here you see quite a different position. Uh, in Sri Lanka's case, the external constraint has become particularly um, significant. And you can see for a, a very extended period of time, they've effectively been operating outside an area that is externally financially sustainable. Um, and then in terms of the, the uh, fiscal position, they also have fiscal rules, although they haven't been particularly good at complying with them. Um, so they have a 5% of GDP deficit rule. And although it varies and the target has shifted, currently it's 80% of uh, GDP uh, debt uh, limit. Okay, so if you again, if you change some of the dynamics um, in in Sri Lanka's case, they have quite a high uh, import propensity. If you were to bring that down quite significantly, you see that uh, the alternative scenario takes us into an area of financial sustainability. If you were to reduce the costs of net external liabilities. Um, let's say to 2%, then you see that the area of external sustainability increases uh, quite significantly and it starts to move the country into um, uh, uh, outlook and prospects that are at least uh, externally sustainable. Um, in Sri Lanka's case, personal transfers are quite a significant source of free of cost um, foreign exchange earnings. So if you make additional assumptions about the rate of growth of those personal transfers, let's say to 15, so oops, 15%, um, then you see it has quite a, a significant impact on the area of sustainability. This would be different in the case of Indonesia where uh, personal transfers are less significant source of income. All right, in terms of um, gov uh, government spending growth, Again, if you make different assumptions here, um, a key issue for Sri Lanka would be that their, their um, revenue to GDP ratio really collapsed partly as a consequence of their tax choices. 
Um, and so if you were to ramp up the government revenue to GDP ratio to let's say 18%, um, um, then it starts to have some sort of impact. But a key issue here would be the average cost of public sector liabilities. Interestingly, in its, despite its, its current state of affairs, um, Sri, uh, Sri Lanka has managed to borrow money um, um, to fund its, its so, so it's, uh, the average cost of its public sector net liabilities has actually been negative in real terms. Um, but if it was to was able to borrow money at a similar rate to maybe the OECD countries at the moment in real terms, uh, maybe minus 5%, um, then it starts to change some of the dynamics. If, however, this cost goes up into a positive realm, um, then you see it starts to have um, quite significant impact on, on um, the, the outlook going forward. I think that sort of takes me to the end of my time. So um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions if those are, if there's scope for that. But um, otherwise, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Many thanks, Kiv. Uh, indeed, you, you have one minute <laughs> uh, more to talk, uh, but uh, thank you. And now um, we we'll have uh, the uh, intervention of Nelson Barbosa. Nelson Barbosa is professor at uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Brazil and the former finance mi minister uh, uh, also in Brazil. Nelson was uh, one of the three referees um, of the SDA, SDFA framework and gave uh, uh, many uh, important uh, suggestions uh, for the improvement of the framework. And um, he will talk ab about the usefulness uh, of the SDFA, uh, especially in the current situation when developing countries are, are facing increasing balance of payment constraints uh, linked to both real and financial uh, issues. Uh, thank you, Nelson. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Daniela. Can you hear me? Well, okay. Yes, great. Yes. First of all, thank you for the invitation. And I'm it was very good to see the both presentations, especially the translation of the theoretical concepts into a dashboard. I think that's the, the way to go and what really helps policymakers in analyzing the, the constraints and the possible alternatives to deal with it. I will just make some brief comments on, on, on the model and, and how, is it, how it is useful today. Uh, we're seeing another, we're ex experiencing another uh, adverse supply shock all over the world with a substantial increase in the price of food, fuel, fertilizers, and many other commodities. This usually uh, makes the balance of payment constraints more stringent and translates itself in the, into an increase in inflation everywhere in developing than develop economics. Uh, the best of, of payment constraint can be, as Gustavo was shown, can be modeled in many ways. Uh, in this case, the case of the current shocks, the trade part becomes important in many countries because you can you may go into a situation where you don't have enough foreign currency to meet your import requirements. We see that in Sri Lanka, we see that in Argentina, we see that in some other developing economies. That was the original way the balance of payment constraint was modeled in the 1950s and 1960s, in that era where you had capital controls. So most of the constraint was a trade constraint. And this is still an important, still an important trade constraint in many developing economies. But with capital liberalization and uh, a general adoption of floating exchange rates, we have 
The best of payments constraint now is more of a stock flow constraint over or a stock stock constraint. What I mean by that is that debt ratios and solvency uh, indexes, mainly say the ratio of foreign reserves to foreign debt, or the ratio of, of high liquidity money to international reserves becomes very important to access a country's vulnerability to external shocks. And today, the balance of bank constraint also appears as the cost of, for, of exchange rate volatility. Even for countries that have uh, large uh, or high stock of international reserves, say as Brazil, you can see the, the balance of payment constraints through the implications or the effects, the domestic effects of exchange rate volatility. It increases inflation, it increases uncertainty, it requires, an, it, led, it leads to a high risk premium that ends up appearing uh, as a high fiscal cost of rolling over domestic debt both public and private. I, I think the, the SDFA framework is in the, in the right track to try to identify the main transmission mechanisms from the best of payment constraint to the fiscal constraint. This, the fiscal foreign link is not simple, as it was shown by both Gustavo and Keith. Uh, but I think uh, to make it more operational, we will have to, one way to go is to analyze the fiscal costs of international vulnerability or international uh, exposure or dependency on capital flows. This may appear, this is appearing now, as many governments in the world are acting uh, as a stabilizer of last resort, adopting food fuel subsidies to attenuate the impact of international shocks and exchange rate shocks to domestic inflation. We see that especially in Latin America. This also appears as the carry cost of international reserves. Because for most developing economies, you have to borrow at very high rates internationally. And, uh, sorry, very to borrow at very, very high, rate, high rates domestically and you earn very low rates internationally. So this carry cost can reach as high as 1%, 2% of GDP. And it subtracts, as Gustavo pointed out, it subtracts fiscal space to do other things, to do other policies to meet, the, for example, the development goals. I think this carry cost is easy to measure, it is one way to adapt or to expand the model uh, uh, and make this foreign fiscal link more explicit. Uh, in the past, this was also analyzed not only through the kind of models that were mentioned, but also in what people used to call gap models in development economics. The logic is basically that you have different constraints, and each constraint has its own growth rate that is compatible with uh, fiscal or foreign sustainability. As Keith was showing, uh, the foreign constraint and the, and the fiscal constraint, each of them ha has a required growth rate for the debt ratios not to explode. These growth rates are usually different. And at any point in time, one of the constraints will be the binding one. Uh, usually the, the foreign constraint dominates because it's indirectly or directly when the government is the borrower internationally, the foreign constraint directly determines the fiscal constraint. And as Keith did quickly here, changing the, changing the cost of foreign debt or fiscal debt, uh, the dynamics of the growth rate and the interest rate, the net interest rate, or the net financial cost of that dominates the dynamic. This is something that Domer already said 
in the 1940s that no matter what, how you model the dynamics of the current account surplus or the fiscal surplus, for developing economies and, may, and also for some developed ones as we're seeing in Italy and Spain right now, the variations in the cost of debt and in the growth rate of the economy, what we call the R minus G factor, tends to dominate any, any debt dynamics. And because of this, adjustment uh, processes or adjustment plans that do, that do not uh, uh, change the structural determinants of growth and do not alleviate the cost of international debt tends to fail. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't work if you try to produce the balance necessary to stabilize that if the cost of, of the debt and the growth rate of the implicit revenue is, is not changing. So that goes back to what Penelope was saying in the, in the beginning, that any adjustment process to a financial constraint has to also be consistent with a structural change that affects the growth rate and the cost of debt, the R minus G, Otherwise, the problem just keeps reappearing over and over again. And one thing that I would like to add is that in this structural adjustment, it may be necessary to allow that ratios to grow for a while. Because we have uh, many fiscal rules and exchange rate rules that put a ceiling on some on that ratios. But in also in many, many situations that we, has to go higher before it goes lower. And this transition happened in many developed economies before they became developed. But at the current uh, organization and institutional rules for developing economies, that is not feasible. So you keep hitting the ceilings and you keep having to have that restructuring without solving the fundamental constraint which has to do with the determinants of the economy's growth rate and its vulnerability to international shock that appears as a high interest rate, as a high risk premium on whatever interest rate domestic borrowers have to pay on foreign debt. So these are my, my general comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. Um, and also to bring light uh, to the usefulness of the, the SDFA and also how to move forward and um, improve the framework. Uh, and regarding this, I would like only to, to mention uh, that as uh, Gustavo Penelope um, uh, also uh, mentioned, this is a work in progress. Uh, then the SDFA uh, will uh, be extended in, in a, a, a current next uh, development account project uh, to the climate related SDGs. And I would only like to stress two issues that I think is important uh, to add to the discussion. Uh, first, one, another difference of the model is that it considers the net uh, external liabilities, the net public debt, and the uh, standard models consider only the gross. Why this is important? Because one, we have one uh, consequence of, of uh, related with the reserves. Uh, reserves is an asset of the government, but also the government has other assets. The count. Then this is important also to, uh, to consider when measure sustainability, uh, the, uh, the external assets and the public sector assets. But the second issue that I think is, is more important is that uh, the cost of the external liability uh, depends on the composition of the external finance of, and of the development finance that when I'm looking at the SDGs. Then the 
model also uh, allows us, I think this is uh, one important uh, policy implication, a uh, tool for uh, policy makers, uh, that to reduce the cost of the external liability and also of the uh, public debt, uh, the developing countries, mix and leaks, need to, to have uh, development finance uh, with lower cost. Uh, then how to, because change the, the structure of the balance of payment, the structure of import and exports through structural transformation is a medium long term process. But yeah, the, these countries need development finance to achieve this transformation. Then the, uh, the, how to solve this puzzle? Now, developing countries need more concessional finance, more ODA, uh, and including have uh, UNCTAD uh, has proposed already the SDRs linked to the SDGs. So we need uh, the international community need to uh, uh, take bolder uh, actions uh, uh, to scale up developing finance and uh, and the, especially now that we have all the challenges of climate change and the need of climate adaptation. Then I think the, the model also is useful to show. So how uh, is the financial uh, development finance needs and how this composition could reduce the cost of external liabilities and, and then uh, alleviate the uh, balance of payment constraints in the sense that finance this balance of payment uh, constraints and uh, allow for that sustainability, external finance sustainability while achieving, uh, achieving the SDGs. So only to, to, to add some issues to the discussion. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss. We are already run out of time. And I don't know if uh, Penelope would like to, to say uh, last words um, for this first day of the webinar. Uh, thank you. Just my last words are to thank everyone for the session, uh, especially to you. Thank you, um, Gustavo, Keith, and Nelson for joining us uh, for your very considered and helpful interventions. Um, I think, as Daniel has said, there's work still to be done. Uh, we are keen to do it, <laughs> and uh, we're not um, considering that we have uh, reached the end of the road, um, but we greatly appreciate the, 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 the work that's been done so far. So thank you very much. We have come to the end of day one, um, and we are now going to hopefully invite you to join us again tomorrow, where we will start the day by having a look at some work that's been done by ESCAP, specifically in the Asian region, focusing mostly on Pakistan, I think the session, um, but of course their framework has much more general application and we hope that you will then join us afterwards for a session on Africa and then Latin America. So much to look forward to tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, all of you. Bye.